Chris Mikowski of Emerging Civil War, and joining me is one of my Emerging Revolutionary War colleagues, Mark Malloy. Mark is the author of several books in our Emerging Revol Revolutionary War series, and he's one of the historians who brings you free content every day at EmergingRevolutionaryWar.org. Mark, thanks for being with us today. Yeah, no, thank you, Chris, and thank you for help starting Emerging Civil War, which, of course, uh, we branched off to to also cover uh, the Revolutionary War. Um, for people who aren't familiar with Emerging Revolutionary War, I'll give you a little background on who we are, what we do. Um, and I'm going to talk to you all about uh, uh, really how we use a lot of free Internet uh, uh, source material to help do research. Uh, and I'll use examples that I use. Uh, when writing my books with emerging revolutionary war. Uh, I gotta, so I've got to point out, you've got George Washington on the wall behind you there, right? Yes. Yeah. I have uh, George Washington behind me and I got the uh, March into Valley Forge behind me as well. So it's uh, really a passion of mine uh, ever since I was a kid and uh, being able to have the opportunity to, to, to not just read and consume all this information about our past, but to participate in the, uh, research and writing about it is uh, really made me happy to to have fallen into emerging civil war and then also participate with emerging revolutionary war as well. So first uh, in war, first in peace, first in the internet of his countrymen. Yes. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I, I call this uh, presentation "Hacking the History" um, and it's uh, digital sources for studying the revolution. Um, but like I said, I want to give you a little uh, uh, background on, on who we are at uh, Emerging Revolutionary War. Um, and this was actually, you know, started by um, a, a lot of the guys who, who, who are involved with Emerging Civil War. Uh, some of these faces you might be familiar with, uh, uh, Rob Orson and Phil Greenwald uh, were the ones who helped start it up back in 2015. Uh, originally, it was just uh, they were doing some blog posts occasionally on the Civil War page and decided to branch off and to create our own uh, emerging a branch, uh, Emerging Revolutionary War. Uh, and here you can see a, a group of us, including Kevin Pollock, Dan Welch, Billy Griffith, and myself. Uh, there uh, on, the, on the battlefield of Greenspring uh, down in Southeast Virginia. Uh, one of the things that ties kind of all of us together is uh, many of us are public historians. So during our day job, we're working at historic sites, whether it's with the National Park Service or the county or a private nonprofit. Um, but that's kind of what we do during the day. But we all have this passion for the Revolutionary War. And uh, we also have a passion for being in the place where history happens. So uh, we always are uh, looking to go on uh, opportunities to travel to battlefields, cemeteries, uh, uh, be out on the ground where it happened, find out what happened. And, uh, and through Emerging Revolutionary War, we're able to share with people uh, a lot of the insights we get, um, a lot of the research we do and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, so kind of the, the central component of Emerging Revolutionary War is our website, uh, which has a blog on there. Uh, you can uh, visit it at www.emergingrevolutionarywar.org. Um, and on there, we, we put up blog posts about either things that are happening, uh, research we're doing. Uh, we do book reviews of scholarship out there on the Revolutionary War. Uh, and, uh, and we're always looking for, for, for more people who are interested in authoring things. So if that's something that you're interested in dipping your toe into, uh, definitely uh, reach out to us through the blog. Uh, and we'd be happy to uh, review content and, and, and post some more blog posts up there. Uh, but it's really a great resource um, and, and the things that go up there on that blog uh, really kind of live forever. We, we have uh, uh, we track the statistics and uh, when things, you know, people will find a lot of our articles through Google or other search engines. Uh, and they'll be able to find the research that we're doing uh, and be able to get plugged into a lot of that that uh, uh, information that we're putting out there. But EmergingRevolutionaryWar.org is where kind of uh, you can get all the information about who we are and what we do. Um, you can also uh, follow us on social media. So we, uh, we, we do have a Facebook page uh, that we're pretty active on. Uh, we do have a Twitter page, uh, or I guess it's called X now, uh, X page. Uh, and we also have a YouTube page. Um, and YouTube, we have uh, uh, tons of videos. I think we're almost up to 100 videos at this point. Um, and uh, what the, this kind of built out of the pandemic when it first started and everybody's kind of stuck at home, 
uh, we decided to start having Zoom calls uh, that we would uh, uh, play live through Facebook. Um, and then uh, we would just keep doing this on a weekly basis. Right now, uh, what we're doing is every other week uh, on Sunday evenings at 7 p.m. Eastern, uh, we hold a, uh, a what we call a Rev War Revelry. Uh, and the idea of this was kind of like a almost like a happy hour where we can sit around, enjoy an adult beverage and discuss some aspect of a revolutionary war history. Um, and then that, this has since grown to where we've had all sorts of not just ourselves talking amongst each other, but bringing in experts from all across the country, all across the world uh, to talk about various research that they're doing. We've had archaeologists and authors, um, uh, public historians, all sorts of people. And it's a great way uh, to interact with other professionals. Uh, but you can watch along live and provide comments, and and we were able to do uh, Q and A's through that as well. It's just a great way to to uh, stay in tune with what's going on in the field. Um, these videos uh, that we record, and like I said, you can find them on our Facebook page, but then we put them also up on our YouTube page. Uh, and like I said, we almost have almost a hundred of these now, and each one's about an hour long, so that's a, a plenty of content. Uh, with whatever aspect of the revolution, we try to touch all sorts of things, whether it's the Southern campaign, whether it's uh, what's going on on the, the Western theaters uh, or in Boston and, and Philadelphia, we kind of cover it all uh, throughout that. Uh, and then we take the, the audio files from those uh, revelries and we uh, upload those up onto our podcast. Uh, so, um, you know, one of the things I do every week is I'm mowing the lawn. Uh, if, uh, you know, if I miss the episode of one of these, I'm able to plug it into my earphones and I'm able to listen to uh, these discussions. Uh, and you can get that through Spotify or Apple Podcasts, wherever you get podcasts through. Um, and so it's also just a great way. One of the things we like to do when we're driving, you can see right up here on the Spotify one that we got the Battle of Germantown. Uh, a bunch of us went up to Germantown to, to get a tour up there. And uh, as we were driving along, we listened to the, the revelry to, to hear uh, author Mike Harris talk about the battle, what happened, uh, the significance of it. So by the time we got there, we were all kind of tuned in and ready to, to learn more once we were there. So it was just a great way to, uh, to be able to get that information on the go. Um, but through this whole process, uh, you know, we've, we've also been keyed into all sorts of different opportunities. Uh, you've actually may have seen some of us in uh, recent documentaries. Uh, I'm still getting emails from people who uh, happen to turn on Fox Business Station. And uh, uh, you may have seen uh, there was a Fox Nation documentary uh, called The Battles of the early American history with uh, Kelsey Grammer um, and uh, uh, myself and Phil Greenwald were, were brought in to, to be on those as talking head experts. Um, and so that was just a really neat experience. Um, uh, but that's, that's one of the, the things that kind of grew out of this. Um, you know, every year uh, we do host a symposium um, about the Revolutionary War. Uh, this year, unfortunately, we're not doing one, uh, but we are planning to do one next year. Uh, but usually in the past, those have been held in Alexandria, Virginia, uh, which is uh, pretty midway on the Eastern Seaboard. But uh, as you can see, uh, C-SPAN, uh, like they do for many of the Emerging Civil War conferences, come and cover the, our conference as well. Uh, and is also a great way you can go on the C-SPAN library and look up Emerging Revolutionary War and find a bunch of the presentations uh, from the different members on uh, in the panel, like you see here, uh, that we've done at Symposia in the past. Um, but what, you know, like I said, the thing that really kind of keys us all together is it's not just the reading, it's not just the research, it's not just the stories, uh, it's the place. Uh, uh, nothing will compare to being in the actual spot where history happened. Um, and like I said, generally we were do, kind of doing just trips of the emerging revolutionary war fellers. We go to different battlefields uh, uh, and we always had such a good time. And uh, you know, our, our uh, book series, which I'll talk about in a second, also include, you know, tour guides and driving directions and walking directions of, of what to see when you're on the battlefield. Uh, but what we wanted to do is try and bring this uh, experience and open it up to anybody who's interested in doing that. So uh, starting in 2021, we started doing an annual battlefield bus tour. Uh, so here you can see our first group there that we're at right at the, uh, the crossing site uh, up in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. 
where Washington crossed the Delaware River. Uh, you can see George Washington right there in the center made a surprise appearance at that uh, a bus tour. Uh, but, you know, uh, we sold out uh, our uh, every year for this bus tour. This was our first one up in, we did Trenton and Princeton. Uh, last year, we did Valley Forge and Monmouth. Uh, and in just a couple months, uh, we got a, a sold out bus heading down to Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, and we're going to be focusing on the Revolutionary War sites in and around Charleston. Um, but uh, this is something, it, it, you know, if you're interested, uh, we'll be announcing uh, later this fall our uh, 2024 bus tour. Uh, but it's just a real enjoyable way because, like I said, nothing's going to nothing's gonna replace the fact of standing where Washington crossed the Delaware and being able to, uh, you know, not just not just learn about it, but to really experience it. Um, and so we do that as well. Uh, and I, I gave a little mention too about the uh, book series. So just like the Emerging Civil War has the Emerging Civil War series, we started the Emerging Revolutionary War book series. Um, and you can see right here in the center, all that can be expected is our latest release about the Battle of Camden. And I uh, uh, was just talking to, to Rob and Mark Wilcox that that, that book is, uh, is officially out now. Um, so we hope you, uh, uh, and you can see all the different titles we got. We have everything from Lexington and Concord, uh, uh, Trenton and Princeton Valley Forge, um, uh, Monmouth. You know, these are great books. Uh, they're, they're short, they're readable. Um, they also are heavily illustrated. Um, they show you, you know, historical scenes, but they also show you what those places look like today. And like I said, the really most valuable aspect of it is there's a, a driving tour in each of these books that will take you as a, you can use these books as a, a guided uh, tour book. So you can actually, with the GPS coordinates, so you can go to where those places are and you can learn from, uh, read about them on the actual site. Um, and I was honored to, yeah, I, 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 I wrote the book about Trenton and Princeton. It's called Victory or Death. And, uh, and my latest one that just came out uh, a couple months ago is To the Last Extremity, the Battles for Charleston. Um, and that's about Charleston, South Carolina, and all the battles that happened around there. Um, so definitely check those out if you uh, are interested. Uh, and like I said, now these are the two books that I wrote. Um, and uh, so part of this presentation I'm gonna tell you is, is uh, you know, how many uh, uh, free digital online sources are available out there for researchers of the revolution uh, that you can really get uh, lots of good information uh, without even having to leave your house. Um, you know, I know hi historians typically uh, will go to actual archives uh, to access primary source material. Uh, but in the past uh, few uh, decades, you know, a lot of technology has come out. A lot of work has been already put in to digitize a lot of these sources, and a lot of them are free and available online. Um, so uh, you can actually do much of this research from home, uh, and I'm going to key in, key you into some of those uh, those free online sources so that. If you're interested in possibly researching or writing something about the Revolutionary War, I think you'll find these uh, these websites and these sources uh, really beneficial. Um, and like I said, here you can see the uh, the image there in the uh, uh, National Archives, people doing actual research in the archives. And uh, just to be clear, the, the tools and items I'm going to tell you about are, are for sure not <laughs> the comprehensive toolkit for the historian. And there is sometimes never going to be a better uh, way uh, to actually research and to see the original primary source material. Because uh, like I said, a lot of things have been transcribed and digitized, but that doesn't mean there weren't errors. Uh, it also doesn't mean that those, uh, those encompass the entirety of the historical record. Uh, so, uh, you know, things are constantly coming up and being found and there are different repositories all across the country and all across the world that have more information about these different time periods. Uh, but this is really going to show you what's free out there and accessible uh, uh, to wide audiences and that you should definitely know about if you're interested in, in writing about something about the revolution. Uh, of course, going into any sort of discussion about writing history, uh, kind of the, the primary thing you need to know is the, the difference between source material. Of course, you have primary sources and you have secondary sources. Uh, the primary sources, you can see that image there on the right of the, the handwritten letter. 
these are these are these are things that were written at the time period by the people involved, firsthand accounts, uh, uh, and uh, those are going to be really kind of the the center of, uh, of of what people's research is focused on. And then you have secondary sources, and those are written after the fact, later, sometimes by people not involved with the uh, events at all. Um, and you can see there, for instance, Douglas Southall Freeman's. Uh, awesome biography on George Washington, seven volumes. There's a lot of research he did uh, into the primary sources, but he then wrote his biography. Those are secondary sources that we can then use to help fill out the historical event. Uh, so it's important to know those difference, uh, differences. And, uh, and I'm going to talk about both secondary and primary source materials. And sometimes your secondary source materials are primary sources. And I'll explain that uh, as we go along here as well. Uh, but it's also important to know, you know, as historians, uh, we are storytellers, uh, you know, there are narratives that we are telling, uh, but to be a historian means a lot more than just telling a story. Uh, we have to take all this evidence, uh, all those documents, those primary and secondary sources, and you're almost like a detective uh, in trying to uh, uh, pull out the truth from those sources. Uh, you know, oftentimes more weight will be handed to primary sources because those people were there at that time. Uh, uh, but then you also have to take into account, you know, what's been written recently about those events. And you have to parse out the differences. Um, and uh, sometimes uh, the people who were, you know, right in the middle of things, they might have gotten things wrong um, and vice versa. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, uh, the his histories that were writ written later are full of inaccuracies or really kind of miss the point. Uh, so you want to go back to those primary sources to try to get a better handle on what happened. But uh, like I said, being a historian is uh, is really kind of like doing detective work. So uh, that's going to be a, a lot. So so we're going to point you in the in the where you can find a lot of these sources. Uh, but, you know, everything has to be taken uh, carefully and to uh, think about where your sources are coming from and then waiting uh, as far as, you know, how reliable are those sources and, and what, what sources should be trusted and what shouldn't. Uh, now, the first thing before I write about any uh, historical event or object is to assess the historiography. Uh, now, historiography is kind of a big word that basically means the history of the history. So, uh, uh, for instance, when I was writing uh, my first book, Victory or Death, uh, that's about George Washington crossing the Delaware River and the battles of Trenton and Princeton that happened in 1776 and 1777. Uh, now, First, before you know, I start jumping into George Washington's letters from 1776, I want to know what other historians have said about this event all throughout the years. Um, and so you can see there on the bookshelf a bunch of secondary sources uh, that I first went to as far as uh, you know, what, what, what were these books that have been written? And always I try to look at what were the most recent ones. Uh, and then I can almost flip to the back of those books uh, go through their source material, see who they're citing for all of their different claims and, and when they're talking about things. And they'll usually point you out to all the other histories that have been written. In the case with Trenton and Princeton, you know, there's a, the first real big history book written about that campaign was written all the way back in the 1890s uh, by actually a Civil War veteran, uh, uh, William Stryker, The Battles of Trenton and Princeton. Um, and so, uh, you know, you have to understand that what he wrote and then other historians then start writing uh, on top of that history that was already written. And people are going to take different, uh, go in different angles and highlight different stories. Um, but it's good to get a real handle on what's already been written um, to understand uh, how your, your, your book is either going to be, uh, you know, how is it, it going to be different or is it going to synthesize a lot of these different arguments? But it's good to know what's already been written about a particular topic. Um, and this is, you know, I don't usually, uh, I, I wouldn't trust Wikipedia for, for, for much of your history. Um, but th this is an example of a free online source of what, if you wanted to get a good idea of some of that historiography on many of these history articles, you can just go right down to the bottom, uh, and see who they are citing, uh, uh for their articles, uh, on Wikipedia. Uh, and you can see a lot of those exact same books that I mentioned before. You can go right down, you can see William Stryker, he's there, uh, as well as David Hackett Fisher, Richard Ketchum, all these other books 
books uh, that have been uh, written about it. And it's great too, because they also often include links and the ISBN. So you can actually either go to a library or, uh, um, or, or, or go online and be able to access those books. So uh, that's a good way of just really getting an understanding of what's already been written about this event. Um, once you once you kind of know that and you, and you want to also look through all these different books that I've written, I use worldcat.org, uh, which is, you know, the world's catalog. It's pretty much a, a good, uh, uh, it, it consolidates a lot of the, the written sources on there. And it tells you in what libraries you can actually find them. Uh, so if you're looking to not just find out what's written, but you know, you want a free way of being able to access that book. You can pop it in there. It'll tell you if it's in your local library, that way you can go and check it out. Um, again, these, these are free sources. Uh, so you don't have to uh, go on and, and buy all these books for your own library. Although I do that a lot just because I like to have it in, in my library for ease, ease of reference. But if you want to get some of that, that, those, uh, that information for free, you can pop it into WorldCat uh, and find those books in your local library. Uh, another great uh, resource, and again, this is something that you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, just it wasn't an option for people. Uh, Google Books. Um, uh, Google Books, you can you can type in there and it will it will tell you most of those books where they are. Now, some of them you're not going to be able to access because of copyright issues. Uh, but again, it, it will tell you where you can find them either in a library or or online uh, for purchase. Uh, but the great thing is all the public domain materials and many of the reference materials from, you know, old 19th century books that have been digitized and they are online there and you can access them for free uh, in, 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 in their full form, which is, and it's, it's OCR, uh, which means you can actually search through the book uh, for a particular keywords, uh, which just makes trying to research a particular aspect from a certain source that much more easy. Um, and I'll give you a perfect example. So uh, when I was writing about uh, Charleston, South Carolina, uh, you know, a great resource is uh, this report that was done uh, by the, you know, the famous Ed Bars uh, when he was uh, working for the National Park Service and he wrote the Battle of Sullivan's Island. Uh, this I could not find in a sort of local library or, or anywhere else. I typed it into Google Books uh, and again, because this is a public domain document, the, the entirety of that book is uh, is on there and it's searchable. So I was able to simply download that and uh, uh, read through it. And it's uh, excellent uh, consolidation, obviously, because it's Ed Bars of, uh, of the entire battle and campaign for Sullivan's Island in 1776. Uh, and again, so I'm, a, I'm able to, to, to research all of this uh, right from home for free. Uh, another example through Google Books, and now this is not just secondary information, again, going back to primary uh, documents, uh, the memoirs of William Moultrie. Um, now, he wrote these. He was the commander of the American forces in that battle. He wrote these uh, in 1802. Um, and, uh, and, and as you can see here, this is the title page of it. Um, you know, it's been digitized in one of these uh, uh, one of these collections. It's been put on Google Books. Uh, like I said, it's searchable. You're able to download it because there's no copyright on it now that it's you know over 200 years old. Uh, and uh, and it's an amazing resource. And uh, it was something that I relied a lot on when I'm trying to find out what was going on at uh, the fort on Sullivan's Island. And here's the guy who actually commanded it. And these are his actual memoirs. Uh, again, free, accessible, uh, free to download. So an amazing resource. Uh, and you can use this for, for all sorts of, uh, especially even if you're researching in the 19th century, all these kinds of uh, books that were being published during that time period, uh, they're great resources. And, and like I said, so many of them are, are available on googlebooks.com. Uh, so that's kind of assessing mostly the, the secondary source material. Now, after I've done that for say Trenton and Princeton, I, I, I read the different books that have already been written. Uh, I've gone back, I found the 19th century books on Google books and I'm able to get a good idea of what people were writing in the 19th century about it. But I wanna know, you know, during the time period, I wanna know what George Washington was thinking in 1776. You're not gonna get any better than his actual writings, what was coming from his pen 
uh, that December 1776. And that's where this website came in. Just This was just a fantastic resource. And anybody who's studying early American history, the colonial revolutionary war period, this is a fantastic resource. This is Founders Online. Uh, and uh, Founders Online is, 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 is through the National Archives. And they have the letters of uh, George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, over 185,000 documents. Now, the great things about these is they're not actual scans of their letters. So you don't have to read the cursive uh, of their actual letters, which uh, you know is difficult. And for the next generation, it, it might actually be nearly impossible. I know that they're not really teaching cursive anymore, uh, but thankfully these letters uh, have been transcribed uh, and in addition to being transcribed, uh, they've also been uh, annotated. Uh, and, and it's just an amazing resource. Uh, and it's all searchable. Uh, and you can search either by keywords that are in the letters, or you can search during a certain time period. So if I want to know what George Washington was writing from November of 1776 to February 1777, you can, you can block that down and Boom! You have you know a hundred letters there that were written you know either to George Washington or or from George Washington and uh, and so that's just an amazing resource and I'll use an example here um, uh, you know one of the amazing things during that campaign that winter campaign in December 1776 is that Washington himself is writing to people saying that he thought that the game was pretty near up. Um, and I had, I had read that somewhere and I wanted to see if that was actually from Washington's hand. Well, as you can see on this, I was able to, to search the, you know, the author, George Washington and the quote pretty near up. And you see the first result that pops up is from George Washington to his brother, Samuel. It was written on December 18th, 1776. Uh, and you're able to pull that up. You can read the entire letter and it's, uh, uh, you know, everything that he's writing about. And as you can see, they got the footnotes there. They'll, you can click on, they'll tell you more background about anything that was going on. Um, and you can actually read, and, you know, and like I said, nothing's going to top, you know, if Washington himself is saying the game is pretty near up, uh, you can imagine that the, the, the cause was in a pretty desperate, uh, 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 situation being that he's even writing that. And as you can see, if you click on these footnotes here, uh, you can see there's just amazing, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the staff of the National Archives puts in here of, uh, you know, whether the letter that he's referring to has been found, links to letters that he's referring to, um, you know, other drafts. So uh, this just helps you contextualize a lot of the stuff you're reading as well. But like I said, 185,000 letters. Uh, you really got to, if you're writing about, you know, anything with one of those major uh, founding fathers, uh, this is this is the go-to place to find their letters to find out what they're uh, what they were actually saying. Now that's that's for the you know for George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, kind of the the leaders of the revolution. What about the common soldiers? Uh, unfortunately, unlike the American Civil War, where we have you know plenty of letters and diaries from common soldiers, uh, the common soldier of the Revolution. First of all, there's way less of them uh, than in the Civil War, uh, and there are hardly any surviving letters and diaries from the common soldiers. So that that's very sparse material. So we know what George Washington is writing. Uh, thanks, thankfully, that's been preserved. Uh, but what about the common soldier? Kind of, what was their experience, and how 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 you know how can we flesh out the stories from their perspectives? Uh, and that's where like the importance of the pension records come in. So uh, in the early 19th century, the United States government uh, decides that they're going to uh, give pensions uh, to veterans of the Revolutionary War. Uh, they eventually broaden the scope of the of, of these pensions uh, to also include the widows uh, and anybody who served in the military at that time. Um, but of course, when the government says they're going to start, you know, giving away this money. They want records from the veterans of who they are, what they did, what their experience was, um, and then corroborating evidence from either other soldiers or officers that can say, yes, he was a soldier there. Um, and, so, uh, and, so, and so you have this flurry of activity in the early 19th century of all these pension records of all these soldiers who are writing down or, or you know, describing to, to, to the official uh, who they were and what their, their war experience was. 
And, uh, and through this is just a wealth of information of what it was like for the common soldiers um, and things that, you know, the, the generals and the leaders in charge, you can't really get their perspective on uh, like you can get from some of these pension records. Now you have to, you know, be careful with these records too, because again, uh, you know, many of them are going to be found to be invalid uh, because, uh, you know, there are going to be some people who are trying to get this money um, uh, and either making up their service or exaggerating. And this is also, you know, sometimes 50 years after the fact uh, and memories weren't as good and um, some things may have been embellished and whatnot. So again, as a historian, you have to kind of uh, carefully consider these uh, these records, uh, but they certainly do really kind of fill out a lot of information. And I'll give you, and, and, and uh, not all of these are transcribed, uh, not all of these are searchable, uh, but some of them are. Um, and uh, this is a great website. If you go to revwarapps.org, uh, that's revwarapps.org. Uh, uh, this is for the South Carolina, the Southern campaign. They have digitized or they've transcribed and digitized uh, hundreds of these pension applications that relate specifically to the Southern campaign. Of course, some of the men who fought the Southern campaign also fought the Northern campaign, uh, but this is all searchable. Um, and uh, so it can really make it easy for you to, to go through and try and find, you know, particular information you're looking for. Uh, and I'll give you an example. Um, this is an example of one of those uh, pension statements um, where the uh, affidavit of uh, Leonard Shackleford, uh, who in 1834 uh, was saying that he had served uh, in the first regiment of the Virginia state line commanded by Patrick Henry. Um, and you can see down here, I was looking, I, I had keyword searched for bayonet because I wanted to see if there was any example of people writing about being bayoneted. And you can see that this, uh, uh, that in the engagement, uh, it, he got run through with a bayonet and that he survived and continued in the service until his expiration of uh, service. Uh, but these are kinds of the stories that you're not going to find in the general's letters, uh, but you can get from actual veterans of the combat that can talk about, you know, here's an example of somebody being bayoneted during the revolution. I mean, that's an amazing story. Uh, and if you can find out what regiment he was in and what engagement it was, it can really start to bring a story more to light. Uh, now, like I said, not all of these have been transcribed. Uh, you can see here uh, the National Park Service uh, is actually, uh, in, as we approach the 250th anniversary of the Revolutionary War, uh, you know, they are working on a project to transcribe uh, many, many more in partnership with the National Archives. Uh, where even you can uh, agree to join up uh, and be one of those transcribers. Uh, and then it, once they get all these transcribes, eventually there will be another database uh, that, again, will be searchable and you'll be able to find many more of these men's stories. Because like I said, a lot of them are kind of just sitting in archives right now um, and they need to be uh, they need to be uh, many of them have been digitized, but they need to be transcribed so that people can can kind of sleuth through them so they can find out, you know, how many stories are are just kind of sitting there that haven't been told yet. Um, and, um, you know, I know that the pension records are really just filled with so many of these stories. So it's a great project. Um, now, this is another uh, another example here is uh, newspapers. Uh, now, newspapers, uh, you know, you, you can use them as either primary or secondary sources. Here's an example of a, a primary source of a newspaper. Um, if you go to research.colonialwilliamsburg.org, uh, they have, you know, all the newspapers uh, from the Virginia Gazette, or many of them from the, the Revolutionary War period, uh, now, these aren't uh, uh, transcribed, uh, so you have to, you know, look through them, uh, but they're great for, for instance, you can see here, this is the uh, Virginia Gazette from January 17th, uh, 1777, and I went there, you know, to get, you know, reaction. How did people learn about the battles of Trenton and Princeton in Virginia? Uh, and you can see, you can read through these newspapers to find out, you know, how the word got to them, what they were thinking and writing about at that time period. Um, but these play, th these are really helpful when you're trying to, uh, to gauge that kind of real time uh, idea. 
Um, but even with uh, uh, later ones, a, a, another one is uh, the newspapers through the Library of Congress. Uh, and this project is called Chronicling America. Uh, and this is just a fantastic resource if you're not familiar with it. Uh, they have digitized newspapers from 1770 all the way up to 1963. Um, and these are just filled with all sorts of things. Now, these are, you know, they're not transcribed. Uh, but all the images uh, have been OCR'd. Uh, so that's optimal character read. Uh, so, so basically they're able to read all the characters on there. So you, so you can search through, uh, you know, thousands of newspapers for uh, certain names or certain phrases and that kind of thing. Uh, and it can give you a real good sense of things, not just from the colonial period, but even from the 19th century. Um, and you can see here's an example. I was interested in in how in how uh, the events of Trenton and Princeton were commemorated in later years. Um, you know, especially during the centennial in 1876, uh, and then even later, you can see here uh, uh, through. You can see I, I you know I was searching through a uh, Battle of Trenton in the in the 19th century. Here you can see the celebration of the 125th anniversary of the Battle of Trenton that they did a reenactment of the actual battle on the actual site. And you can see pictures of the uh, the reenactors. Of course, they're not wearing the, his, you know, what reenactors today try to get it, you know, exactly historically accurate, but local, local militia guards came out and recreated the battle on the street. And there's a wonderful newspaper account of it. Uh, this is a great secondary source of how this battle has been remembered. Um, but if you were, you know, researching civil war as well, this is going to be filled with uh, all sorts of great content. Um, so if you're not already familiar with that, that's a great, uh, great way to access historic newspapers. Again, for free, you can do it all from your living room. Uh, another component of our books, a big component of it, like I said, is, is our books are heavily illustrated and you know the old adage is you know a picture is sometimes worth a thousand words um and that's that's definitely the case with the revolutionary war uh you know the, unlike the civil war there's not as many photographs or there were no photographs but there's uh you know much limited supply of images um and uh you can see here the library of congress and the national archives are really go-to places for getting you know historic images if you do Civil War research, you know that they have just like a fantastic collection, but they also have a great collection of both drawings and prints uh, from that time period, uh, but also later photographs. So you can see, for instance, on the Library of Congress, there's a 19th century photograph of the Trenton Battle Monument, uh, but then also lithographs and drawings and all those kinds of things that were done many years later. Um, another great resource that uh, a lot of people aren't familiar with is the New York Public Library. Uh, they have a digital collection of uh, images. Uh, and again, it's all searchable. Um, and as you can see here, I searched Battle of Trenton and you just get uh, you know dozens and dozens of various prints that were done throughout the you know 19th century, 20th century about the Battle of Trenton. Uh, the great thing about these, most of these are public domain, free to use. Um, and uh, you can also see, you know, th these are oftentimes uh, uh, cut out of different books or newspapers from that time period. And you can see how people have portrayed things differently throughout time. Uh, so sometimes your images are primary sources as well. If you want to write about something like that. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, my master's thesis was on the memory of African-American patriots during the, uh, uh, during the Revolutionary War, how they were remembered uh, in the 19th century, right before the Civil War. Uh, and I'll use this as an example. So I found like this image of a lithograph uh, that showed the Battle of Bunker Hill and the death of uh, General Warren. Uh, if you look in this image off on the, the right side of the image, you will see a white officer and right behind him is a uh, African-American soldier holding a musket. Um, and so, you know, uh, he was included in the original painting and then also this lithograph. Uh, but then you can also see, I found another lithograph that was done uh, where it's almost identical, but the African-American soldier holding the musket was removed in this particular, uh, in this particular image. And then I found uh, another image uh, from 
William Nell's uh, book on African-American patriots during the revolution where the white officer was removed. Um, so you can kind of gather through these different images. And you know, if you look at the dates of when they were done and who was doing them, and uh, you can start trying to find out you know, you know, what the different narratives were out there at the time and how they were using you know, images and the Revolutionary War to further often their, uh, their current kind of uh, agendas that they, were, that they were looking to highlight. Um, but it's just a really fascinating way of, of exploring how, how, how important images are uh, in history. Uh, and as I mentioned, emerging revolutionary war, a big thing for us is being in the place where history happened. Um, and uh, it, this is a great resource if you're looking to um, uh, looking to see what is out at the sites today. Uh, this is called the Historic Marker Database, uh, hmdb.org. Um, and uh, uh, the folks at this uh, organization have really consolidated a great uh, a resource of uh, plaques, statues, monuments, uh, some historic signs, all of these kinds of things uh, th that are tied to GPS locations. Uh, so if you're interested in, you know, uh, you know, at the site where the Battle of Trenton happened today, you know, what plaques are right near there, you can use this to help map that area so that when you're up there, you can actually find some of these things. And some of them are, are, are kind of difficult to find. Uh, and so it's a, it's a great resource. And I'll use an example. Um, uh, this is actually for my Charleston book, uh, a historic marker uh, that actually helped uh, uh, put up in 2010 to the siege of Charleston. Uh, it's one of the only interpretive things that talks about the 1780 siege of Charleston uh, in the city. Uh, but it tells you, it shows a picture of what the marker looks like. It has a, um, uh, it has a, a transcription of what's on that marker. So again, all this is searchable um, and it tells you where that's at so you can actually find it on the ground. So, so this is a great site for, for finding those historic markers. So not only do you have the story, the images, uh, but you also have you know, what's at the, at the place. And you can use these to also kind of see how interpretations have shifted and changed uh, over the uh, years um, from, you know, markers that were put in in the early 20th century to ones like this that was put up in 2010. Um, and like I said, you know, combining all of this stuff is really what uh, the emerging Revolutionary War books uh, and the emerging Civil War books really attempt to do. Uh, so this is these are some pages out of my Charleston book where you can see the you know the actual uh, text in the in the book uses quotes and other things from many of those sources that I mentioned like Founders Online. Uh, but you'll also see uh, historic prints uh, from the New York Public Library, uh, and you'll see what's at the sites today, the plaques, um, the historic marker database helped point us in the right direction. So when we were down there, we could actually find where these markers were and be able to get a record of them as well. Um, but yeah, no, just to, to kind of to wrap up here, uh, uh, this is a handy list of all of those research, uh, 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 all those resources I mentioned, uh, you know, worldcat.org, Google Books, Founders Archive, uh, the RevWar apps, Colonial Williamsburg, Library of Congress, National Archives, Chronicling America, New York Public Library, and the Historic Market Database. Now, this is, like I said, this is, this is top level uh, stuff. Um, there are way more places you can find free historic resources. You know, I know a lot of local historical societies, uh, whether in your state or your county, they will often have things as well. Um, but this is really just looking, you know, I mentioned Colonial Williamsburg, but there are other museums and historic sites uh, that also consolidate a lot of this information. So, uh, you know, it's kind of spread all around, but my goal here is to kind of give you a, a, an entry level of uh, some of the basic ones that you can then branch off from as well. Um, and I'd be remiss, uh, you know, uh, you know, part of this presentation was put together thanks to the uh, American Battlefield Trust, uh, which emerging revolutionary war and emerging civil war help uh, uh, you know, support. Uh, they have a very similar um, uh, they have a very similar mission as us. They are interested in educating people about these wars and the battlefields and uh, doing the hard work of preserving those places for future generations. So 
you know, uh, uh, the next generation will be able to uh, uh, enjoy those battlefield spaces just as we do today. But if you go to battlefields.org, they have a lot of great secondary source material, a lot of great articles, um, and some that, that the historians with emerging revolutionary war and civil war help uh, help them with as well. Um, and of course, like I said, um, I I have to also say if you want more information about emerging revolutionary war, to really follow us on our website, emergingrevolutionarywar.org. Follow us on social media. Uh, get plugged into uh, uh, the revolutionary war. You know, we really want to be your home for America's 250th anniversary. Uh, that is coming up uh, in 2026 will be 250 years uh, since the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, and uh, we're hoping that, uh, uh, you know, a lot of great history comes out of that uh, and a lot of great experiences uh, also of experiencing uh, uh, revolutionary war history in the places where they happen also happens as well. So, uh, but yeah, no, I just want to thank you all for, and thanks uh, to Chris Mikowski and Emerging Civil War for giving me the opportunity to tell you a little bit about our organization and, and what we do. And uh, yeah, we hope to see you out there on the battlefields. Thank you.